wonderful. Yay, I love it when things work. <laughs> okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to JWA's Quarantine Book Talks. I am Judith Rosenbaum of the Jewish Women's Archive. So happy to be back with you tonight for the first session of our summer series. Please say hello, as always, in the chat box. Let us know who you are, where you are. Please make sure to chat to everyone so we can all see it. And of course, throughout the program, add your questions and comments there, and we'll bring them into the conversation. We are so delighted to be able to continue gathering together from all around the world for meaningful conversation and learning, and um, I'm just thrilled to be with you all again. I, I missed these programs. Um, before we begin our conversation, I want to say just a few words about JWA for anyone who is new to us. We are a digital archive that expands the Jewish narrative by documenting and sharing Jewish women's stories. We are grounded in history, but focused on what wisdom we can learn from history for the present moment. And we believe that uncovering a more diverse story helps us understand the world that we live in and make it better. Uh, the quarantine book talks are just one aspect of JWA's work. I hope you will check out JWA.org to explore the very broad range of projects and resources that we offer. I am so excited to welcome Rachel Barenbaum back to JWA Book Talks. Rachel was actually the author featured in our second virtual program way back in March of 2020, uh, when we couldn't imagine we would still be doing this in 2022. Then she was talking about her first novel, A Bend in the Stars. And we've been doing these programs now for so long that she is back with her second novel, Atomic Anna. Yay. Yay. Uh, the, the New York Times book review called Atomic Anna masterfully plotted, and the LA Review of Books called it propulsive and intimate. Rachel's debut that we talked about last time, A Bend in the Stars, was named a New York Times summer reading selection and a Barnes & Noble Discover Great New Writer selection. Rachel is a prolific writer and reviewer. Her work has appeared in Harper's Bazaar, the LA Review of Books, and many more places, including a recent really fun piece uh, on the history of the sports bra. Um, she will be a scholar in residence at the Hadassah Brandeis Institute at Brandeis this fall, and she is a founder and host of the podcast Debut Spotlight. In a former life, she was a hedge fund manager and spin instructor. Uh, she has degrees from Harvard in business and literature and philosophy, and was elected to serve as a town meeting member for Brookline's Precinct 10. Welcome, Rachel. So happy to have you back with us. Hi, Judah. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, everybody. I am so, so excited to be here. I'm a huge JWA fan, and I loved being here for Ben and the Stars so much that I have been looking forward to this for like weeks. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, I also, when I got your book, I read it right away. I just like gobbled it up. And then I was just like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to have you back on Quarantine Book Talks. And then of course, I had to wait months for that to actually happen because the book had to come out and then I had to come back from my leave and all of that. So anyway, here yes. we are, and I'm so delighted. Yay, Yay me too. Um, so let's start, I guess, this is quite a rich and complicated story. Um, it's a story of three generations. It covers a span of many, many decades. Um, so tell us a little bit about how you came to write this particular story. And maybe in telling us about that, you can share a little bit about the story for anyone who hasn't read it yet. Yeah, sure. So Atomic Anna is the story of three generations of women. It's a grandmother, mother, and a daughter, three generations of Jewish women um, who work together to build a time machine to stop Chernobyl, but also to save their family. So there is time travel in the book, but ultimately it's sort of, it's not sci-fi, it's, it's really literature and it's about mothers and daughters and immigration and it spans the Soviet Union to America. Um, and it, it really, you know, looks at um, some big, heavy philosophical questions because the whole book is framed with Pirkei Avot, uh, Chapters of the Fathers, right? This ancient ethical text that um, asks the big questions, if not now, when, if not me, then who? So um, you want me to share some slides and we'll talk about that part or you yeah, want to hold off see, on that? Let's see some of those images that, um, that might ground us a little bit in this. Yeah, so, um, 
so the book, when people ask me, here we go, I'll put that in too. Uh, so this is Chernobyl. This is reactor number four. And the book opens when um, Anna Burkova of Atomic Anna, <laughs> um, she is an old woman. She is the main scientist, the chief engineer, um, the Soviet Union's best ever. She has put her career science above family, above her daughter, above everything. Um, there's a lot of conversation and discussion in the book over, you know, choosing motherhood, not choosing motherhood, you know, women's place. But anyway, it opens. She has built this amplifier to um, increase the power in the reactors. And then reactor number four melts down and it transports her forward in time um, at the meltdown. So the book opens the second that Chernobyl melted down. And this is an image of that. Um, and why? Why do I put it there? Um, and, and where did this idea come from? Well, um, some of you might remember that I grew up with these great aunts who were at our house every Shabbat, every Friday night, because my own grandmother passed away when I was very young. And so her sisters came and um, they would always, you know, call me over. I love them very much, but they smelled like, you know, herring and manischewitz and they would call me over. And, Rachel, Rachel, do you know where the passports are? Do you know where the emergency money is? And I always said yes, because that was my job. I knew where it was. So I have them in my head. I write about women running, just as my great aunts talked about it. But Chernobyl in particular also ties to them in that um, I remember this night in 1986 when I sat down with them to watch the news. You know, it was back when we had to be there at six o'clock sharp for the six o'clock news and I had to adjust the antenna, you know. And, uh, you know, what comes on is that Chernobyl has melted down. And I was a little kid then, and it was just this terrifying moment for me when I realized that grownups really can mess up, right? An accident when you're a grownup means that thousands, tens of thousands, countless people can die. And uh, I've always thought about it, but then when I saw this photo here in 2016, that's when I knew I had to write the book. Because I'd always carried this memory of being there with my aunts watching the news. Um, but then I saw this, there are a lot of essays that came out, a lot of photo essays in 2016 um, on the anniversary of the meltdown. And this is a picture of the pool um, in Pripyat, the closed city where everyone lived that worked at the reactors. Um, and this pool, it just seemed like it was haunted. And what really caught my eye was the clock. And some of you might be swimmers and you know, when you're swimming, you, you watch the clock really carefully, right? Everyone leave, you know, leave on the 15, leave on the 30, right? Whatever, 50 is on the six, whatever. Um, but this clock is just frozen. And it, I don't know, it just has haunted me for years. I was living in Israel when I sat down to write this book in 2018. And uh, this was on my screen always as I was writing. So that's sort of the images and where it all came from. Wow, it is it is such a haunting image to see it just abandoned there. And I actually was living in Israel when Chernobyl happened. Uh, we were there for a sabbatical for my mom. And um, I remember uh, it rained and I remember everyone said, don't go out in the rain because there's fallout in the rain. And I, I didn't, I was like, you know, 12 or whatever. I didn't really understand, 13 maybe. I didn't really understand what that meant, but Again, it was the same kind of thing, adults explaining that and feeling like, how could something that happened all the way in the Soviet Union be coming in the rain here? And if that's the case, then like, we're all screwed. You know, it was sort of this very scary thing about the really broad impact of this and um, and that you can't take it back, that it's just out there, right, yeah. in the world. Yeah, and terrifying, like you're saying that it, the fallout, you know, if it rains, it could be Acid rain is not even to begin to describe, right, the, the horrible things. And um, I also have images, you know, there were kids dancing in the ash right after it happened because there was the huge, right, mushroom cloud or whatever that flew up and then all the ash rained down and people were playing in it that night. And then they, of course, died very soon afterwards. So it's really, it was just a terrifying memory that has always been there for me. I was also thinking about this book so much, um, when the war started this year in Ukraine and thinking about what it was like for this book to come out at a time when 
Russia and Chernobyl were back in the news. What was that like for you? <laughs> yeah, that was surreal because of course I wrote this, right? As I said, I drafted it for the first time in 2018 and then it published just as Russian troops were taking back Chernobyl or taking over Chernobyl. Um, and they weren't wearing any protective gear and they were trying to hide that they had just sent soldiers in, right? And they're sleeping on the ground, the radioactive ground. And I just, again, had this sort of gut reaction of why? How are we letting this happen all over again? And, um, you know, I, this book was not written quickly, <laughs> but, but a lot of people have asked me if it was because of current events. And um, yeah, it was not, but I just, you know, I, I guess those great aunts again, we're always saying we left for a reason, don't go back there. And I, I thought of a lot about them since then. Yeah. Um, I loved, of course, that the book is structured around these three Jewish women, these three generations. And I'm curious how you decided, you know, both what each of their story and role would be and how, and where to locate them in time. How did you kind of figure out the generational, the generational pieces and how that mapped onto history? Um, so it's a great question. So for those of you who haven't read yet, the three generations are Anna, whose story begins with the Russian Revolution. Um, and she sort of spans through, right, the rise of the Soviet Union. She goes to Berlin, and then she's back in the Soviet Union. Her daughter, Molly, uh, lives in America with her best friend, Yulia, and then her granddaughter, Raisa, is also raised in America. They're all in Philadelphia. Um, so I actually started the book with uh, the second to last chapter that's in there, which is, which is um, not a spoiler, I won't get a spoiler, but it is Anna uses the time machine and she jumps back to basically see her childhood. Um, and to revisit her mother. And um, that was the very first chapter that I wrote. And I thought I was going to tell the story of Xenia, her mother and Anna. But as I was writing, I just sort of kept wanting to skip ahead to Chernobyl because I knew I wanted Anna to be there. I write strong Jewish women because that's what I like to read. <laughs> that's what I want to find in books. And so I write them. Um, and, uh, and I just kept jumping to, I don't know, I was just pulled ahead to Chernobyl is really where I wanted their story to start. So, um, and I knew, you know, I wanted, I wanted Anna to be brilliant, but I, I always challenge the notion that women have to be mothers, right? Why can't a woman put her career first? And I wanted her to be, I wanted that to be Anna. And right, what is it like to read about a woman who is so smart and really wants all of her energy in her career? What does that do to the family? Um, and, and what does that do to her? And so that sort of led me to Molly and Raisa and, you know, the following generations as they live through, you know, running from the Soviet Union and uh, what it was like to live in her shadow. And there is so much tension. I mean, sort of each generation, on the one hand, they're, they're working together in this incredible way kind of across history, and they're also missing each other and miscommunicating and misunderstanding each other, and there's all this kind of mother-daughter tension there. Yeah, yes, um, which I love to talk about or think about and write about because, um, you know, I always I wonder like, how much do you really know about your parents or your family, right? If you could go, like you were never a fly in the wall, you, you hear sort of the polished version of any story that is passed down to you. And so, you know, I always like to write about that. You think you know them, but how much do you know? So you see, you know, that Molly thinks she knows her mom, but she doesn't really, right? So thinks she knows her mom, but she doesn't really, you know, and, and I like to, I, that takes up a lot of my brain when I'm writing, how much do people think they know versus they actually know? And so I tried to peel back and reveal those cracks that are in there. Right, and I, and, and you have Molly, filling in what she doesn't know through her comics, right? That she kind of yes. creates this, this comic figure that she can try to explore both who her mom was and, and create something in her absence because she's not raised by her. Yeah, so Molly, um, the middle generation, I really wanted her to be the opposite of Anna in a lot of ways. So Anna is this brilliant scientist, Molly is an artist. So instead of seeing the world by numbers, she sees it by the contrast of light 
right? How forms take shape and how she can draw them and put them on a page. And um, the time period when Molly is growing up and coming of age is sort of the heyday of the second wave of feminism and comic books are uh, one of the huge ways that women are expressing, right? This desire to be more than just in the home, the, you know, sort of Betty Friedan is this it. Right, the problem with no name, and you see that expressed in comic books. And um, so I, you know, spend a lot of time with the comic comics um, movement, which is with an X, led by Trina Robbins. She's a character in the book, very slightly, but she's a real life woman, real life artist. And um, you know, sort of breaking away from this trope of women being thrown into refrigerators because they were actually thrown into refrigerators, like all the time in comic books. <laughs> Right, that's it's insane to say that out loud. Violent for some reason. Yes. Yes. Or women fighting over a man, right? And the big boobs and the small waist and this, right? Impossible figure. And Molly is really trying to break through and find herself in that world. Um, eventually, we see the comic books. So, the comic book series is called Atomic Anna hence the name of the book. <laughs> um, and we see it is used, this comic book, to communicate between Raisa, who is a mathematician, and Anna. So she drops off copies, right, using the time machine to sort of help bring them all together. I loved how they each had their own sort of medium, you know, science, art, math, and they were each, you know, incredibly talented in that arena, but it was for each of them, it was like their own language. And so it gave them a, it gave them both a way to express themselves and to explore the world and to be creative. And in some ways it also kind of added to some of the communication problems because they didn't speak the same language and couldn't necessarily communicate with each other about the things that were kind of most them or most important to them. Yeah, I mean, I think that's very real. Everyone sees the world in a different way and we're all good at something that's different from one another. And I really wanted to reflect that, you know, that we we all see things differently. And um, how do you mend, right? If you're so upset because your mother, your birth mother sent you to America, right? Basically pushed you away. How can you deal with that when you don't even see the world the way she sees it? Right. Um, so I, I really that sort of took up a lot of my thought process as I was building these characters. Well, and it also brings up the theme of intergenerational trauma, right? That yes. like, which I think is so strong here that there's, and, and of course it, that gets us to the time travel question too, because there's sort of that question of like, can you fix that? Is there a way that you can go back and fix that? And it was so funny because I read this book I read another book, um, Emma Straub's new book, which is also about time travel. I'm forgetting right now what it's called. Um, and then I watched right, the new uh, series, the new um, season of Russian Doll. And yes. my family was like, are you having like a time travel obsession thing? Because I was talking about each of them. But I think that question of, of trauma and generational trauma and sort of how those things get passed down and how that question of like, what can you fix? Or is, or is it inevitable? Um, yeah. Came through very yeah. I'm so glad you brought up the time travel glut um, because, you know, I wrote the book in 2018 and um, there were, I think, five books came out on the same day as my book on April 5th, all from big authors like Emily St. John Mandel, right? Emma Straub, like we all published time travel books and we all wrote them completely separately, right? Two to three years ago before they even came right. out. So it's like, what is in what the is water there? Yeah. What do you yeah. think it's about? I mean... I think time travel at the heart is about regret and right. You want to go back and fix something and it's sort of idealized. And so, I don't know, we were all regretting something or right. Looking forward to what's coming, but this, this moment of wanting to change, thinking that maybe you made a mistake. Um, but I don't know, you know, I, I think it has more to do with sort of a, a fear of saying you're sorry, maybe, or a fear of, admitting mistakes and moving on like it would, wouldn't it be easier to just go erase that than right. actually deal with the fact that i feel guilty and i should change going forward right well and on a sort of glo more global scale i mean that's the sort of interpersonal piece which i think is really powerful and then there's sort of the piece of like or maybe this is just how i feel now which is like i think a lot of a, a lot of people feel right now like oh my god i don't know how to fix this everything seems so big so big and so broken and so overwhelming that like we it's very hard to imagine how you can fix it from this moment and the only thing you can imagine is like you have to go 
back because it's so deep at this point that we that it's too big and you know so it's at once a feeling of sort of disempowerment in this moment but also i guess on some level a feeling of empowerment or wishful empowerment of being able to like really make a big change and like leap yourself out of history yeah there's also some nostalgia i know from emma's book too the like the 90s right if you grew up then and it's this time that you loved it was simpler we didn't have the cell phones the instant messaging um i know when i talk to other writers one of the big lines that we have to draw is are you pre or post cell phone Mm -hmm. Right. Or like, are you going to find a way to get the cell phones out of the narrative for, you know, however you do that? Because once you bring in a cell phone, you have instant information. You can reach someone anywhere and it changes a narrative, a book, our lives. Right. But it changes the way you you know, the pacing and every, every aspect of a book changes when you bring that in. So maybe there's some of that too, wanting to get rid of the cell phones. That's so interesting. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. I, I have thought about all of those like movie and sitcom plots where someone, you know, misses someone and then leaves a message on their voicemail and they try to call in to get the message. And, you know, I was like, oh, that doesn't exist anymore as a plot line. Right. We've just, right. but I hadn't thought about it on a narrative level in quite that way. That is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And because also once you start dealing with text messages, there's a different language to them. There's shorthand, there's emojis, there's right. So it's a different way of communicating. And so if you can cut all of that out <laughs> through time travel or whatever, um, you get to sort of what I think of as more pure emotion. Maybe that's because I grew up without cell phones, right? But this, you have to sit down or and talk to somebody on the phone or face to face to actually have a conversation. Yeah. So, so why time travel for you, I guess? I mean, do you, do you see it as sort of more of a, like a historical tool or are you interested in kind of the science fiction aspect of it or the science aspect of it? I don't guess it doesn't have to be fiction, you know? Right, right. Um, so why time travel? So, you know, this is really time travel light. People who love hardcore sci-fi science fiction do not like the way I treat time travel <laughs> because this is really literary fiction with a time machine. So time traveler's wife, outlander type, right? It's, it's really about emotions and love and family. Um, and I love time travel because I'm really obsessed with time. And for those of you who read Bend in the Stars, it's set in 1914 Russia, <laughs> a long time ago. Um, that's the story of a, sci a Jewish scientist who's racing Einstein to prove relativity. And his sister is the first female surgeon in Russia and she goes after him when he goes missing. But throughout that book and throughout Atomic Anna, Einstein is in both of them with this question of what is time? And he very famously started working after school in the patent examiner's office when he couldn't get a job anywhere else, right? No one wanted to hire Einstein. They thought he was crazy. Um, and he was examining machines to synchronize clocks. And that just always blows my mind because, you know, we had to synchronize clocks so we could have schedules, train schedules, boat schedules, like any kind of schedule for us to all be here tonight from across the country, around the world, we have to agree on a clock. And Einstein's big thing was that clocks are just invented. Time is a convention that we all agree on. And I've been pretty obsessed with that notion that time doesn't really exist, right? For a long, long while. And Einstein has this famous quote, I'm gonna totally mangle it, but it's something to the effect of, only physicists like us know that there's really no difference between the past, the present and the future, mm. right? Time is relative. And so, that brings me to time travel pretty easily, right? Because what is time, right? And, and so that's one of the big questions in the book. What does it mean to be doing, right? The past, the present, the future. How do these, you know, pieces fold into one another to make the whole? Right. And, and just on a process level, I was sort of like, my mind was blown because I was trying to imagine, I mean, you do a very good job of, locating every chapter you know it, which character it is what you know when they are and like in re in relation to this big event that happens at the beginning of when anna does her first jump and sees molly shot and that's the moment she's trying to prevent yeah. getting to there so right 
Um, You're so good at trying not to put out spoilers. But it's but, okay. It's hard, but it was also like, <laughs> I was just sort of yet. trying to imagine like, how did you map it all out and remember where everybody was and how it all connected so that like, because obviously as you know, often happens in time travel, when people go back, they change things and that changes things that happen in the beginning, you know, yes. further forward. So then when she goes back or forward, things might be different. So I was just sort of like, how do you even keep that all in your head? Yeah, I don't. It's yeah. not in my head. Right. I have a very extensive spreadsheet. Oh my God. Um, so I, you know, grew up in Excel in the finance world. I use spreadsheets and it was so hard. I just want to say like, you know, especially because if I would revise something and move a date forward by 10 days, right. Or 10 years, whatever, it doesn't matter. Everything after that also changes. So, um, you know, I, I had to keep very careful track. So the chapter heading on each one says the number of, or the section heading, the number of days until Molly dies on Mount Aragots. And we know that happens right in the very opening scene, right? That you were talking about, Judith, she's going to die. And that's what we're working up towards, hopefully to avoid. Um, and so I just, you know, I, I have it in one column, right? All the, the dates of everything happening. And then, you know, the, you know, the chapter and then the character and what they looked like then and what was happening. Because if Anna already has gray hair by this day and this chapter, then she has to have gray hair, you know, going forward. Or if she had short hair in this version of, you know, history, then I had to keep it short throughout unless she changed it. So it did get very complicated. Um, and the fact checkers at my publisher at Grand Central, they spent a lot of time checking and rechecking to make sure I got all those details right. So, so far, no one's written in to say we missed anything. <laughs> I'm hoping it'll stay that way. Yeah, I was just very impressed because it was complicated. And I kept flipping back and forth in the book. And I was like, oh, my gosh, how do you even figure out how to write it? Um, but I guess yeah. I wouldn't have thought of spreadsheets. But so the, then I want to get back to the comics thing, the opposite of spreadsheets. Yes. <laughs> the art piece. Um, yes. you, you talked a little bit about that. Um, I know that um, you had some artists create some images that would go with it. And it was just so interesting to me to see the comics brought in because it's not a graphic novel, but you lean on the whole story of kind of feminist comics and using that as a, you know, as a mode of expression and also as a plot device, because it's not only Molly's medium, it's also becomes this way that Anna and Raisa communicate and it's kind of amazing. Yeah, yes, so comics, so I am, also a little bit obsessed with the second wave of feminism, right? And Shirley Chisholm and Gloria Steinem, right? And Betty Friedan, like all of these women are just like, they are amazing what they did. And it's horrible how much of it is being ripped down right now. We won't go into that, but I tried to celebrate them, right? As much as I could in, in this book and what they were doing. And Molly also celebrates them. And so, um, I'm going to just share my screen with you for a minute. We're going to go back to this um, presentation here. Um, hmm. Here we go. OK, so one of the people that I talk about um, in the comics movement that really inspires Molly is Trina Robbins. And she was really the first, one of the first women, the pioneers of this movement to make women stronger and fighting. And this image came out on the front of her It Ain't Me Babe comics um, compilation that she put together. And this was so unusual to see strong women fighting, right? These heroes in here. So this was Molly's inspiration. And she was so visual in what she saw. And Trina Robbins was so visual. I mean, this was a crazy movement at the time time, um, you know, fighting to have women in the comics themselves, drawing them, writing them, publishing them, coming up with plot lines, and Molly really falls into this world. And so when I put the book to bed, there's like, um, I guess it was maybe January, um, the book was published in April, and I just was sitting around and thinking, I would love to see my characters in Atomic Anna, the ones that I described that Molly draws, like, I'd love to see them come to life. I wonder if I can do that. Um, and so I looked around and I found some artists, uh, two women who were just, you know, sort of very early on in their careers. Um, and uh, they, I hooked up with them and they drew <laughs> the comic books that I imagined. You know, I gave them excerpts from the book 
and said, these are the characters that Molly is drawing. So we have Atomic Anna, Mighty Minerva, and Rocket Raisa. And uh, this just blew my mind. So this one, um, these comics were done uh, when Molly was younger. And you see they look very, right? They're young characters and they're um, fun and exciting women. Um, all right, they're a little animated. And then these were characters that came out when Molly was older. And I talk in the book about how her figures, they change. And so here I had a different artist who drew these. Um, and you see at the top, um, this is, um, you know, Rocket Raisa is different. We see some love interests coming in. I had such a great time putting these up on like TikTok and Instagram. And people were really into these two pictures of the men. <laughs> and so I wanted to just show them they got a lot of interest. Um, but I, th it, this was just so amazing. And then these were the ultimate, um, you know, comic book covers that they put together. So we didn't draw the whole comic books. We just did the characters and then came out with these. So Angela Wu's is the one um, with the characters that Molly would have drawn when she was older. And Emily Reed drew the younger ones. Um, and uh, yeah, these are, and then in the middle, you see one cover that didn't quite make the final cut, <laughs> but it was a really fun project and a great way to just sort of interact with the book and launch it and get it out into the world. Yeah, I saw that stuff on social media and thought it was so cool. And, and what was it like for you to see something that had been in your head be brought to life by somebody else? I mean, it was amazing. And the whole process, these women, um, Angela and Emily were so talented and gifted and just into it, right? And they were like, this is amazing. They're comic book characters in a mainstream novel. And, you know, um, and there's a lot of back and forth, you know, any kind of art is a collaboration. And so I would say, you know, oh, they don't look old enough. They don't look whatever strong enough or they're too old or whatever. So, you know, it was this whole beautiful process of bringing them to life. And then it was a great way to launch the book, right? With these comic book covers that I had dreamed up. And I just felt like they captured it so well in that, that moment in the book. Well, we had a, a question already from Susan who asked whether you've ever thought about making this into a graphic novel. And do you think you would continue to have more pieces of it brought to life visually? Yeah, I mean, I would love to work on it. And there's been um, a pretty good amount of interest. So we need to see, you know, sort of, where it goes <laughs> I don't know I mean it was you know it's, it's pretty amazing totally um I want to get back also to something that you s mentioned sort of in passing earlier which is that each section starts with a quote from Pirkei Avot and and actually you start the whole book by introducing that as a framework um you say sort of in a what is that called an epigraph um mm -hmm. You wrote, Pirkei Avot, meaning Chapters of the Fathers, is a collection of Jewish ethical teachings and stories passed down from generation to generation. It begins with a warning, be patient in judgment. Um, so why Pirkei Avot and why specifically call out be patient in judgment uh, yeah. as the opening? Yeah, so um, back when I just graduated from college, um, I had this amazing fellowship in Israel for a year. and. Um, our first, one of our first assignments was to read Pirkei Avot, and I had never read it before. And it just sort of blew my mind because, you know, there are the big questions in there. If not me, then who? If not now, then when? And we see these sort of ancient rabbis. I was thinking of them as like these old men were sitting around <laughs> talking through these big questions, but the questions really hit something, resonated with me you know, like maybe this is what I need to think about as I go out into the world and try to figure out where I'm going to fit because I had no idea, right, what I was going to do. But to think of that as guidance and then to read, be patient in judgment. I, I just think that is some fantastic advice for pretty much anything we do, right? Let alone reading a novel. And it's easy to look at something and judge it quickly. But this idea that you should take your time especially when you have such hard questions. So the book opens with Anna. She's transported um, through this time machine, right? Reactor number four melts down and the amplifier that she's holding turns into a time machine and it takes her to Mount Aragots um, to a cosmic ray station. Actually, I actually have a picture of it. 
<laughs> right here. This is the real life cosmic ray station. It's now in Armenia. It was the Soviet Union. Um, these are the computers that were inside of the ray station, cosmic ray station. And so Anna's there and she finds her daughter, Molly. Um, and Molly is dying. And Anna realizes that she can go back and save her daughter, save the one, or she can go back and save many, all the people at Chernobyl. And that's also a question from there. It's a very Jewish question, sadly, that we've had to answer too often in history. Do we save the few or do we save the many? And I always think from a distance, that's an easy question to answer because obviously you should save as many people as you can. But what about that moment when you are making that choice, when you are holding your daughter, when she is dying in your arms? Is it that easy? Um, and that again takes us back to this be patient in judgment because you still, right? You can still make the different decisions, the hard decisions, but you just need some patience, patience in judging the people and you know, asking these questions. So that's a very long answer to your very good question of why pure K a vote. But I, I just think those big questions have taken up a huge amount of my head for a long time. And I wanted to put them into this book for that reason. And I think also one of the huge questions that comes out of the story is the question of unintended consequences. And, um, and that's also a big piece of being patient in judgment. Like we don't have, you know, without time travel, we don't have the ability to know what's coming and, and people can assume they're working towards one thing and have it be something else. And I think that story is very much wrapped up in the, in the story of the Soviet Union to begin with. Um, but it's, yeah. but, you know, with anything, with any kind of technology and what the intentions are and how it plays out. Um, and I think that that theme is also very strong in the book and is, you know, is, Oh, I think you're right. These questions, as we know, because they're part of Pirkei Avot and therefore have been relevant for thousands of years, they also have particular relevance, it feels, in this moment. And I felt re reading the book, I actually, I had remembered that Pirkei Avot was part of it. And then when I went back to reread it this week, I looked at that opening again and I, and I just felt like that be patient and judgment piece felt so relevant for this moment of just like where everyone is so quick to jump on everybody's mistakes and mm -hmm. you know, the whole dynamic of cancel culture and a sense of just like there not being any humility of, of, you know, everyone thinking that they know what's right and are ready to tell someone else that what they're doing is wrong. Um, and so I was sort of like, oh, I want to lift that out and put that in that framework as well. Yes, I love that. And also the one of the big questions I ask is just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? Which is another one, just because we can build a power plant, right? Like Chernobyl, does that mean we should? Just because we can build this weapon, doesn't mean we should. And uh, that's another thing I wish we would sit around and think about a lot more before we rush in to do it, you know? Right, and that, right. And that requires also some imagining, some creative imagining about what unintended consequences might we be able to, you know, predict if we actually pause to think about it a little bit? Yeah, you know, I was talking to someone who had read Atomic Anna um, about this question, just because we can doesn't mean we should. And she said, what if we never built the combustion engine, the internal combustion engine? Like, hmm. what if we just, you know, we knew we could, but it was going to kill the earth. Right. What if we never did that and instead forced ourselves to come up with something else? I just thought that was like, that really stopped me when yeah. she asked that. Right. And I think, right. And, and, and then there's the question of like, what do you give up once you've already created it? Can you let go of something just because it exists? Does it mean you have to continue to use it? And I think that's going to also be a really relevant, continue to be a really relevant question. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, it, it's relevant already in terms of in, in the terms of the story of this book around nuclear power, even thinking about that, but I think it's going to be true on so many levels in terms of climate. Um, I saw we had a question that I want to, I want to make sure I don't lose questions that are in the chat, in the chat. Judith M asked about your favorite authors. Ah, um, so many, so many. <laughs> um, I know it's a hard question to answer. I know. So I can tell you that um, some of my favorite books that I'm reading now, um, B.A. Shapiro has a new book, Metropolis, right? Lisa Barr has Woman on Fire. Um, 
Uh, so those are some strong Jewish women writing some amazing books that are coming out right now. And I love them. Um, Anna Solomon's book, I love. She blurbed uh, Atomic Anna. Um, you know, so let's see, so many. I'm like looking around. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> There's so many. I, I, you know, fell in love really with um, the idea of strong Jewish women when I was a teenager and I read Anne Rand for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I know people now sort of poo poo and whatever, but when I was, you know, my 15 year old self couldn't put those books down. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so it depends where you are in your life in that stage. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about your research process, because I, I kept thinking about all the, because you're talking about, I mean, it's so hard to write about so many different time periods. There must have been a lot of research involved. Yes. Um, you know, it's funny because research, when people ask me this, I think like it's not actually really like work or arduous, right? Because I love it to sit down and read about Mount Aragots, right? And the cosmic ray station, like the Soviet Union built some weird stuff. This is real, right? So sitting down to read about this and looking through the photo essays that um, this amazing photographer, Toby Smith, he took these pictures, you know, he put together for National Geographic and The Guardian and, right, that's some amazing stuff. So just sort of, um, I look around and see, right, I'm, so I'm thinking, where would, I, where would someone build a, a time machine in the Soviet Union? And I just naturally read, you know, a lot of a lot of anything <laughs> that I can get my hands on. And so I come across this cosmic ray station and I think, well, that's where you would build a time machine. Right? Like what, what was saw. it meant to be used for? I don't even really understand what a cosmic ray station cosmic is. Cosmic rays, like right? So from Star Trek. Yes. Yeah, so it's like up on top of this mountain and cosmic rays, energy are coming down and they're trying to measure it and you know, see if they can capture it or harness it. Right. The Soviet Union doesn't actually say everything they want to do with it, but study this energy raining down on the earth. Um, and it's pretty much deserted now and you know, hasn't been used in decades. Um, and so a lot of it is just sort of reading, looking around and looking for ways to fit the pieces in. I mean, reading about Chernobyl, um, Midnight at Chernobyl, Adam Higginbotham's book, right? You know, see that HBO series was based on that book. So good. Um, and, you know, so I do a lot of that kind of research and looking around to see where my characters are going to be and then what I need to read from there. Um, but I don't, you know, sort of burrow into a library and pull out the 5 million books, um, you know, sort of as it comes up, I say, oh yeah, I need to learn more about what was happening, you know, how they were developing the bomb in Berlin and who was working on that and what it looked like. And so then I might take out, you know, 10 books and send my kids to the library to pick them up for me. <laughs> That's their favorite job, bring them home in these big bags and read through it. Um, and then I also try to get people on the phone, um, because this is COVID or on Zoom to, you know, really interview them and ask them, when they have expertise in the area, can you talk about this? Mm -hmm. You know, tell me what was it like to arrive in Philadelphia from the Soviet Union? Um, so do a lot of, you know, interviewing and talking to people too. Mm -hmm. And how wedded do you feel to that, to the historical reality? I mean, obviously when you're writing something that is A, fiction and B, involves time travel, you are departing from reality on some level. So how do you think about like how much you need to be wedded to what really happened or, or actual, you know, truth? Of yeah. It? Yeah. So how much is real? So I, when I look, it's different for every author, but for me, my comfort level is I completely make up the characters. They are not real. They are women that I dream up and would love to meet, hang out with, you know, be related to, <laughs> love. They are women that I want in, in the world. Um, but they're the worlds that they live in and they inhabit, I want to be real so that they are dropping into a place where everything around them is real. So in Berlin, Anna um, sees, for example, she's there as um, you know, Hitler's rising to power, the Nazis, and she sees the tram jump the tracks, the trolley, and the fire starts and all of the flags with the swastikas go up in fire, you know, all the way down the street. And so that was um, a real life incident that I read about. And there were pictures documenting that, for example. 
And so I thought, what if I put her in that moment? And she is a Jewish woman, but you know, nobody knows she's Jewish. It's not stamped on her face or anywhere else. And so the people, you know, she's there in the middle of the fire and she's being treated like she's, you know, not a Jewish woman, like she, you know, belongs there with the other people. And so that moment, right, is just one example. They're all real moments in history, really what the world was like and, and could have really happened, did really happen. But Anna was never there, right? That That's all made up. I was thinking about it also, because when you write about time travel, you talk about there being this rule of two, you know, that yes. you can't jump to a particular place more than two times, and you can't stay more than two hours, and you can't get too close to your your other self in that time. Right. And it was one of those things that I was, I was reading, I was like, oh, that may, okay, those are the rules of time travel. Then I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> like, I was like, how did she know that's how, that's how it works, the rule of two. And then I was like, oh, I, right, she just made that up. I forgot that that's how these things work. But like, it was so interesting to think because you sort that's of the best. down as a rule. And I was like, oh, those are the rules of time travel. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best. Thank you. Yes, that's like my dream comment, by the way, that someone would just go with it. Totally. Yeah, I mean, it's you have a lot of authority in the story. So I was like, yes, okay, <laughs> that makes sense. I guess that's how time travel works. Yes. Yeah, so every time travel story has to have rules. Um, you know, like people joke about Star Trek rules. And if you're a Trekkie or people listening, you watch Star Trek, they're always rules to the universe, you know, or to the book. Um, that you have to sort of come up with and abide by. And, and if you're going to break them, you have to know you're breaking them. So um, the rules of time travel changed several times in several different drafts, I will say that. But then I landed on the rule of two and um, just seemed to work. So I'm glad it did. I'm glad you were there with me. Totally. Um, so can you tell us anything about what you're working on now? Yes, I can. So um, thanks for asking. <laughs> um, the, well, saw, not everyone likes that question. I usually, usually in the time before we get online, I ask people whether it's okay to ask that because some people get very stressed out about that. And I forgot to uh, ask you, but I'm glad to hear that you don't feel bad about that question. Yes. No, I mean, look, I'm a writer. I'm always writing. So of course I love to talk about it. Um, the, uh, this fall, I'll be a scholar in residence at Brandeis at the Hadassah Brandeis Institute, and I'm working on a collection of short stories and it is fictionalized, right? Version of, um, four real life Jewish women who were assassins working to kill the czar in the 1880s. So one of them ran the safe house, one built the bombs, one planted them. Um, and, uh, you know, one woman sort of planned everything. And their names that are sort of buried in history, we've never really talked about them, no one's heard of them. And so I wanted to give them a voice. And so I'll be writing their, you know, four short stories and they're tied together. Um, and that'll be my next, next, next project as well. Nice, well, that sounds perfect for a future JWA book talk. So we look forward, <laughs> we look forward to yes! that. Yes! Glad you're sticking with your theme that is very well aligned. And I see you're also sticking with Russia. Yes, yes. Well, you know, I came across these women. Um, I'm actually also working on a novel right now. And um, I was doing research for it. And I came across these women. And I just thought, how come I've never heard of this? There was a Jewish woman who ran the safe house where, you know, the people's will was meeting to, to plan out the assassination of the czar. Like, no one talks about her. Or no, this that, woman that who- That doesn't surprise me, actually, to be quite <laughs> honest. And yeah. I'm wondering if she's on our site. Did you see if we have her on our site? Um, you know, I can't remember which of them are, I think at least one was, I'm but sure I, um, are, yeah. yeah, but, but they're sort of hidden. And then, and one of them was, um, found guilty after Alexander II was actually killed. And she stood up at the trial and said, I feel like I have to tell you I'm five months pregnant. And so then they executed the others, but not her. Mm. But what a moment, right? For a woman to stand up, she's being tried. She's, you know, supposed to die for this crime. And she says, I'm pregnant. And they say, then you're just going to jail instead. I wow. mean, I I just really was so moved that I want to write their stories. Mm -hmm. It is, it's very interesting. And it's not so, as I said, it's not so surprising to me that you, there were Jewish women involved, but it's also not surprising that we don't know their stories. Cause I think that there's, um, you know, there's both 
first of all, generally revolutionaries haven't haven't necessarily like broadcast their Jewish identity, even if it very much influenced their revolutionariness, um, because it either could be dangerous to them or because they sort of rejected religion as an ideology. Yeah. Um, but also, it's complicated for Jews to own people who were violent, and you know, I think sometimes those characters are downplayed in certain ways um because you know we might read them differently you know we read them in our in a in a current moment of thinking about terrorism or thinking about violence and it it can be uncomfortable but it is a really interesting part of history and part of jewish history and part of jewish women's history and um right. and, and there's a lot of i you know i think those stories are not only so dramatic and really challenge our idea of who revolutionaries were and what who Jewish women were um, in different historical periods, but also force us to ask really big questions about like how, you know, what it takes to make change and um, I don't know, I mean, so many different questions about yeah, you know, I mean, about really, what people that's are all... devoted to and what people are willing to live and die for. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of what I talk about in Atomic Anna, too, with Anna Berkova, my main character. Was she mad? Was she a terrorist? Right? The person who builds the first atomic bomb. What is that person? Do we celebrate them? Are they are they a hero? I mean, how can you celebrate someone for building something that's going to kill millions of people? Right. And yet, right? And who's recording how we think about them and shaping that? Um, and it's very easy to push Anna off in the book, her colleagues do, is this crazy woman, right? And who's mad. That's the word that's always attached to women is they're mad and they're crazy. So we don't even talk about them. So um, like you, I am drawn to this question. of <laughs> What is madness? What is the Jewish woman's place, right? In history and in all of this. And that is, that is the core of Atomic Anna too. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that that question also of like, who do we hold up as heroes is a really important one and all of your characters and maybe not Raisa as much because she's younger and she you know but certainly with Molly also they're not simple characters they do a lot of things that are not admirable and um and they're also not easy to get along with necessarily they're like prickly um yeah. and so it's kind of an, it, it you know but then you're inside their heads too so you can sort of you get to know them in a different way and you see more what um, what is motivating them. And I think it's a really interesting piece. I, I heard this great story from um, one of our academic advisors uh, fairly recently about this gets back to that question of where we where we think of nuclear, you know, of, of bomb creators in the pantheon of Jewish heroes. Um, and she was telling me that at her daughter's day school, they were using JWA's resources, always happy. To Yay. Um, and they were using them for a project that kids had to do where they picked a, a hero and then did a kind of exhibit thing on them. And so I think it was a fifth or sixth grade class. And so one of the um, very good researchers found something particularly interesting on the site, um, which was about um, Jewish women who were creating feminist sex toys. And she decided that's what she wanted to write about for the exhibit. And as you might imagine, in this middle school classroom, the teachers were a little concerned that this might not be the best thing to include in the exhibit. And so they had a whole meeting at the school about like, could, could, did they have to steer her to somebody else or could they let her write about this? And so one of the teachers pointed out, well, someone's doing, um, you know, Robert Oppenheimer and, you know, do we celebrate him as a hero maybe? And, you know, this and person was- Right, you know, like they they certainly were going to allow that person to be to do that topic and put it in this exhibit. And she was like, and she wants to write about people who are creating pleasure, <laughs> not people <laughs> who are creating atomic bombs. So why is it that we're having such a hard time in this? Anyway, I thought that was a very good, um, yeah, you know, a, a reminder that, and we think about this all the time at JWA with who we put in, and does everybody have to be someone who we celebrate? No, of course not, because we're not just looking for, you know we're not looking for hagiography. We want to show people in their complexity and, and no one is good in every way. And, um, and so you have to be able to live with that. And that complexity actually is what makes it really interesting and real. And, um, and I love how you were able to build that in into the book. 
it also changes over time, right? So in the moment, maybe we thought the people working on the bomb were, you know, amazing heroes. And maybe now in retrospect, we don't. But again, that goes to who's writing history and when. And so that's why your archive is so important, right? <laughs> Put the women in there, give them their voices. So we have that to always go back to. Yeah, we need to have as complex and varied a story as possible so that we can you know, dig deeper into how this world works and have a lot of different models to look at and to play with. And, um, and I think fiction does that so beautifully too, because it allows us to identify with people that we might not otherwise ever, ident not only never identify with, but never even hear about or think about, or, you know, worlds that we don't get a chance to encounter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what is your, you mentioned you're also writing a novel. I'm curious what that is about. So that one I'm not ready to talk about yet, okay. Okay. but we'll stick to the short stories, yeah. We have a couple more minutes if anyone has any questions that they want to add into the chat. The, our, uh, our community has been fairly quiet tonight, not so much chatting happening. I guess people, I don't know where, where all of, what the weather is like where all of you are, but it seems like most of the globe is suffering under incredible heat as we are in Boston. I'm in my attic and it is really hot up here, which is why I'm so shiny. Um, <laughs> Same here. So I will tell you one thing that people always like to ask me about is, yeah. um, you know, how many drafts it took. Mm. And um, right, because people always say, it seems like you sort of pulled this together, even with your spreadsheets, right, that it all flowed. Um, and I always like to remind people, especially for those of you who might be thinking about writing, working on writing, right? I mean, um, this was, a, I wrote this the first draft in 2018. And I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages that were written and cut and right we'll never see the light of day and so what you see as this shiny product at the end took a very long time to get to and many many readers to help me figure out what was working what wasn't um and i just saw the question pop in is there an audiobook and yes i have an amazing audiobook cast um and people always like to ask me about the audiobook too. Did I have any say in the audiobook and the people, the cast, because they're a whole a bunch of different readers. Um, and this was so much fun. So Hachette Audio is my publisher for the audiobook. And they people audition, right? The professional readers, audition narrators. And then Hachette sends me a bunch of clips, audio clips. And so I play them, you know, for my family, for my friends, everyone. I'm like, which one do you like? <laughs> you know? And then I get to send back my top three for each one. And then they they choose the ultimate narrator. So uh, they did a beautiful job. It's a beautiful audiobook. So I hope if you're going to listen to it, uh, that you'll love it too. And just want to clarify, in case this wasn't clear, that the the book include, you know, that comics are part of the story, but they don't appear in the book. So you wouldn't be missing anything That's by right. listening to the audiobook. There, there aren't visuals that you would, that you would miss. Um, yeah. I never thought about the fact that authors might get a say in who reads the audiobook. That's very cool. It's really fun when you get those files, you know, I sort of okay. jump to go listen to them. Okay. Like, oh no, this voice is all wrong. Totally missing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or they'll say things a little bit, you know, sometimes I have to work a little bit on the Philadelphia accent. Right. So... <laughs> There's a question about the cover of the book. Do you, can mm -hmm. you explain anything about the, the cool cover? Yeah, so um, actually this cover came, it was one of the first, so like the audiobook, I was given three choices for the cover. Um, for Bend in the Stars, it was a much longer process to come up with the cover. This was one of the first three that I saw and I just saw it and I was like, I love it. The artist truly understands. So the red is for the Russian red, um, right, or the Soviet red. Um, in the book. And then there are pieces of women, of Anna, basically, um, because she's traveling through time. You see all the different pieces of her, but we never really see the whole until the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in the end, you sort of get a sense of really, you know, how she learned to heal herself. So um, that's how this came together. And uh, I, I feel very lucky to have such an amazing cover in the end, because sometimes it's a very arduous process. Yes, I know most of my writer friends are you are often unhappy with the cover that they end up with or yeah. semi-happy. Right, because you spent great. three years writing something and then an artist who maybe read your book maybe has spent 
10 hours, right? Or 20 hours on it says, here is the sum total of your three years of work, right? That is going to be displayed in every bookstore around the country. And it's like, but here, I think we actually hit it on the first one. So I was really excited about that. Fabulous. Um, at, right, and and the the, the Jewish has, stars, right? Um, there are Jewish stars in there, right? Stars. I mean, it's sort of all the components are in there. It's yeah, just beautiful. It, it is really, really well done. Um, and I saw that someone asked a question about the books behind me, which some people often ask me: Are these? Is this a fake backdrop? No, this is actually my library. Um, that would be a whole different program where I could just pull books off the shelf and we could do spontaneous book talks, not with the <laughs> authors, because many of them are. You should alive. do that. I think you'd have a lot of people listening. I'd be there. <laughs> well, someday, maybe we'll get to that. But uh, they, I like that idea. Uh, well, yes. anyway, thank you so much, Rachel, for sharing this incredibly rich story with us, for sharing with us a little bit about your process, which I'm still just totally in awe of. Um, it's really so much fun to have you here with us again. And of course, I'm already looking forward to your return. So I'm glad <laughs> to hear that you're, you're at work at, an, at another project that is relevant. To us, I mean, of course it would be relevant, but you know. Judah, thank you so much. Truly, this is the, one of the biggest highlights of my book tour. So thank you. I just love chatting with you. I love JWA. Your organization is amazing. And I can't thank you enough for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you. Yes. And thanks to everyone for being with us. Um, as always, you can learn more about some of the topics we talked about tonight at JWA.org. Um, for example, we have a whole exhibit on Soviet Jewry stories. Um, with some oral histories and you can check that out and you can learn more about Jewish women's comics and graphic narratives uh, in our encyclopedia. You can read an interview that we did with Trina Robbins actually. Um, so check all of that out. Um, I buy hope, the book, please. Of course, buy the book and the, <laughs> the link is there in the chat. Um, and someone asked about the audiobook. You can find those through Audible. You can find them at your local public library. I take audiobooks out of the library directly through my phone from um, my mm -hmm. local library. Um, I hope that you will all join us next week, same time, same place, for a discussion with the artist Siona Benjamin about her two books relating to growing up Jewish in India. And it's really just wonderful to be with you all again. So until next time, be well, stay cool if it's hot where you are, and have a lovely evening. Good night. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Bye-bye.